Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. Hello, uh, this is Nazir Habib. And uh, today I'd like to discuss the management of respiratory failure in patients with coronavirus. And this is a very difficult uh, position that we're often faced with in terms of deciding the next steps in managing ARDS with COVID and exactly when to intubate because the practice seems to be very variable. That is what I've noticed. And so I'd like to review some of the guidelines that are stated by major societies, as well as your own experience may guide you in this difficult situation. So first of all, let's review the respiratory failure symptoms that occur in patients with coronavirus. As you can see in this chart, that most patients do not develop respiratory failure or dyspnea until about day seven or day nine of their initial symptoms. And some of these patients, about 5%, will go on to become critically ill and end up in our ICU. Generally, the patients may progress slowly, but there are some patients that may progress very rapidly. And many patients have been noted by physicians to have dyspnea and rapid respiration, but do not appear in any other significant distress. And they may be quite hypoxemic, and we call this happy hypoxemia. And this has been noted by many folks. So generally what happens in patients with coronavirus is that the shortness of breath occurs in the second phase of the illness, generally in the second week. And there are two phases of this, there's the 2A phase and the 2B phase. And initially the patient may be short of breath and they may show signs of uh, uh, infiltrates on their chest X-ray or in their CAT scan and their procalcitonin may be normal. They later on in the hyperinflammation phase develop very severe pulmonary infiltrates with ARDS, shock, cardiac failure, at which time the inflammatory markers may be very elevated. So if you look at this schematic here, you'll see that about 50% of the patients with coronavirus remain asymptomatic and the infection stops after about 10 to 14 days, and they often return to work. About 50% of the patients do have symptoms, but fortunately 80% of these are very mild and they don't even need to be hospitalized. About 20% then end up being hospitalized, but most of them do recover in seven to 14 days. The patients that we worry about are these patients that makes up about 15% of the patients that end up in the ICU, right? And out of that, some of these become very, very ill. About 50 to 60% of these will end up in the ICU and end up requiring high concentration of oxygen. And some of them end up uh, needing mechanical ventilation. So about one and a half percent of the patients end up needing ICU and about 1% end up dying. So what are we looking for in patients with respiratory failure? and ARDS and what's called Corona ARDS or COVID ARDS or CARDS. Well, initially the patients have no symptoms. Portraits and the passage is mostly in the peripheral areas of the lung. And on the CAT scan, you can see ground glass opacities and crazy paving appearance. Now the two phases in the pulmonary involvement of COVID is the type L, which is primarily when you get thrombi in the lungs. And later on in the second phase, they develop the type H, which is based on the elasticity of the lung. So type H means that they have become very stiff. And type L in the early phases when they mostly have thrombi in the lungs, the lungs are quite compliant. And you may not see the typical high plateau pressures or stiff lungs that we're used to, for example, in H1N1 or influenza. These patients hypoxemic uh, uh, mission rapidly worsens sometimes. So in the initial management of the patients with coronavirus, we start nasal cannula when the SpO2 is less than 90% with the goal of maintaining your O2 sats around 92 to 94. If the patient's condition worsens and their O2 sats continue to drop, the next step would be to start high flow nasal cannula. 
And this is the general practice all over the world, is to initiate high flow nasal cannula, as this is very safe, and it may prevent the patients from getting intubated. Generally, we recommend starting the patient on 30 to 40 liters uh, airflow with the high flow nasal cannula, and you titrate the FiO2 to maintain O2 sets at 90 to 94%. However, patients may fail high flow nasal cannula. And therein lies the major decision uh, point whether we go on with non invasive ventilation using BiPAP or perhaps CPAP or to intubate. Generally, you do want to intubate a patient who has altered mental status. There are signs of unsustainable, unsustainable work of breathing. The hypoxemia doesn't get better. The PF ratios continue to decline. Certainly, if the patient is fatiguing and has respiratory or metabolic acidosis, one should consider early intubation. The risk of aerosolization with coronavirus is clearly the highest with non-invasive ventilation or any nebulizer treatment. These are particularly very risky procedures as it may cause infection in the healthcare providers. If you see, look at high flow nasal cannula and non-rebreather mask and nasal cannula, the aerosolization risk is very low. In fact, the high flow nasal cannula has lower aerosolization rate than regular nasal cannula. There are several concerns that have been raised with the use of non-invasive ventilation, particularly BiPAP in patients with COVID ARDS. The number one concern is that these patients are at risk of what's called self-induced lung injury or patient silly self-induced lung injury. And that is because most of these patients have respiratory alkalosis with rapid respiration rate and extremely high tidal volume, sometimes up to 15 cc's per kilo. So when you dial in IPAP or pressure support, you will often increase the tidal volume into the unsafe range. That we consider greater than nine cc's per kilogram ideal body weight. Setting the alarms and watching the tidal volume and the minute ventilation on your BiPAP machine is crucial. It is absolutely critical to not let the patient have excessive tidal volumes or excessive respiration rate and high minute ventilation as this will cause lung injury very quickly and you will lead to more ARDS type of picture, type age and cytokine release, which may occur within hours. On the chest x-ray, sometimes you see uh, signs of injury, including pneumomediastinum, sub-Q air in the neck, as well as pneumothorax. And that, that certainly tells you that you've gone way too far. So the risk of excessive tidal volumes is that the type L ARDS then rapidly becomes type H, which then leads to incubation and extremely stiff lungs. So the indication for BiPAP should only used in very select patients, such as COPD exacerbation, hypercapnic respiratory failure, and sleep apnea. This is traditionally where we've used non-invasive ventilation with great success. The complications of using BiPAP with COVID is exactly the problem that I have just mentioned, which is the patient's self-induced lung injury, which it shows that the patient has very high tidal volumes and respiration rate, and you may have injuries such as this patient with the chest X-ray has pneumomediastinum, as you can see in these arrows. There are many other risks to using BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation, including inability to feed the patients and they develop malnutrition. We are unable to prone patients based on the ARDS guidelines. We're unable to monitor plateau pressures or driving pressures when they're on non-invasive ventilation. We have also noticed patients develop mucus plugs and dry oral airway uh, secretions, as well as ulcerations have been noticed in the airway. So there's very significant risk, and this has been outlined in several papers recently. So let's look at the guidelines as mentioned by societies and government agencies. This is the National Institute of Health guideline, which says that for adults with COVID-19, 
and hypoxemic respiratory failure. Despite conventional oxygen therapy, the panel recommends high flow nasal cannula over non-invasive ventilation. In the absence of an indication for endotracheal intubation, the panel recommends closely monitored trial for non-invasive ventilation for adults with COVID and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure when high flow nasal cannula is not available. So the National Institute of Health clearly frowns upon the use of non-invasive ventilation. How about other agencies? The US Department of Defense and COVID Management Guidelines in the use of NIV says early intubation over NIV if high flow nasal cannula fails. The Surviving Sepsis Guideline from the Society of Critical Care Medicine as well as the American College of Chest Physicians suggest if high flow nasal is unavailable or patient not tolerating it, then only use NIV, but generally intubation is recommended. These recommendations are very well described in a recent article by Nicholas Hill in CHEST in September 2020. So another factor that may help, since there are no absolutes in managing patients with respiratory failure with COVID, is what is known as the ROTS index. This is the Respiratory Oxygenation Index, which was first described in 2019 in Spain by Roca. What they found is that the ROC score, which is calculated by the O2 SAT divided by the FiO2, fractional inspiration of oxygen, times the respiration rate, accurately predicts if you should continue non-invasive management of a patient with ARDS versus intubating them. If the patient's ROC score is over 4.88 at 12 hours of use of high flow nasal cannula, then one can continue safely not intubating the patient. However, if the ROC score is less than 3.85, this is 100% predictive of failure at the time frame of 12 hours. And this has been validated at Temple University in Philadelphia by Patel and patients that were uh, published in April and May. They had over 800 patients with ARDS and COVID. The other most important issues in terms of deciding when to intubate the patient is to look at the blood gas and also check the chest x-ray and make sure that there are no signs of injury like pneumomediastinum or subcutaneous air. Measurement of the PF ratio traditionally under 150, one would consider intubation, especially if the patient's tidal volumes are over nine cc's per kilo and their respiration rates are above 35 because then this patient is now at risk of the self-induced lung injury, which we discussed. Also, if the patient is septic, they're on vasopressors, they're having myocardial infarction, or any instability like altered mental status or CVA, they should be intubated immediately. Again, prior to intubation it is very important to discuss the COVID status and if the family or patient wish to proceed with intubation. All I can say is that clinical judgment here is key. And although there are no absolutes, there are clearly harm in delaying intubation of these patients. So this is the ROCS derivation. Again, you measure the SpO2 divided by the FiO2 times the respiration rate. And they looked at over several years, 157 patients. As you can see here, that if you look at this 12 hour, the area under the curve is 0.74 if you use the uh, ROCS index of less than 3.88. The ROCS index is over 4.88 after 12 hours. This suggests that the patient can be successful with managing without intubation. However, if the patient's ROCS score at 12 hours is less than 3.88, this very well predicts that the patient needs to be intubated. So we've developed an algorithm here. So what we're recommending is that we start the patient on nasal oxygen up to maximum of six liters before proceeding to high flow nasal cannula, ensure that the patient's O2 sats are greater than 88. Again, it is important to follow serial blood gases, ROCS index, PF ratio, and chest x-ray 
as well as evaluating if the patient is at high risk of self-induced lung injury. If the PF ratio is over 150, one would continue high flow nasal cannula. And if the ROC score is greater than four or five and the blood gases are stable and the chest X-ray is stable, one would continue high flow nasal cannula. CPAP or BiPAP should only be considered in patients with COPD with hypercapnic respiratory failure or pulmonary edema. If the patient is on the fence and their ROC score is between four and five, one would monitor them very closely and trigger mechanical ventilation if they continue to worsen. If the patient is worsening and requiring higher flow oxygenation, and if their ROC score remains less than 3.8, one should consider intubation and then follow the ARDS guidelines as we will discuss soon. Again, it is important to discuss code status and palliative care consultation prior to proceeding with intubation. So one would recommend intubation if the PF ratio is less than 100 or less than 150. The patient may be a candidate for ECMO, check the chest X-ray, make sure that their infiltrate's not, not getting worse, whether they have any evidence of barotrauma, if their ROX index is less than 3.8, if they require pressors, if they're having myocardial ischemia, acute kidney injury, metabolic acidosis, excess secretions, altered mental status, persistent high tidal volumes, and one should clearly proceed with intubation without delay. Again, discussing the patient's mortality and prognosis is very important. As the CDC guidelines here show, the statistics show that the risk of hospitalization for patients over the age of 75 is eight times higher, and their mortality is 220 times higher if you're over the age of 75. And if you're over the age of 85, the mortality is 630 times higher. So they have very, very significant uh, mortality and they may burden or suffer from excessive interventions. Once the patient is intubated, this is very important that in order to prevent the alveoli rupture and uh, lung injury from the ventilator as well as self-induced lung injury, it is important to initiate the patient on low tidal volume. Remember, this is based on the predicted body weight, not the actual body weight, and this is how you calculate that. The patient initially, if they're intubated early, may show the type L uh, COVID lung injury where the plateau pressures may not be more than 25, in which case the patient's tidal volume may remain six to eight cc's per kilo. Once the plateau pressures go higher than 30, you're looking at type H, ARDS. In obese patients, the plateau pressures may be greater than 35. It is recommended that you use the high PEEP protocol when you have type H ARDS versus the low PEEP, which may suffice in type L. So again, very important to differentiate the two categories. You want to sedate the patient and use neuromuscular blockers as needed, preferably with bolus rather than infusion. Early recruitment of the lung, avoiding the stepwise recruitment maneuvers may help in the first 48 hours. If the patient's PF ratio is less than 150, it is recommended that you prone the patient every 12 to 16 hours. And then if the patient continues to have severe hypoxemia after you have performed these maneuvers and the PF ratio is less than 80 in certain patients, they may be candidates for ECMO and you need a consultation. So generally, as you want to, do here is you want to check the plateau pressure as shown here. The driving pressure is the difference between the plateau pressure and the dialed in PEEP. You want to try to maintain the driving pressure less than 15. You want to try to avoid further lung injury, which will then cause alveolar flooding as well as cytokine release. So in order to do that, you may actually have to drop the tidal volume gradually even down to four milligram, milliliters per kilogram predicted body weight. This occurs more in the type H where the lungs are very stiff and the plateau pressures are over 35. Again, patients progress from type L to type H, but not the other way around. 
And generally you want to increase the feet, maintain a driving pressure less than 15. So this is the schematic of the stepwise ladder of how to manage the patients with ARDS. Initiate low tidal volume, monitor the plateau pressure, keep it less than 30. If the patient's BMI is over 35, you may allow the plateau pressures to go to 35. If the PF ratio is less than 150, you want to initiate neuromuscular blockade and prone positioning. Also ensure that the patient does not have asynchrony and cause self-induced lung injury by high tidal volume. And if the PF ratio is less than 80, one should consider ECMO. These are the indications for VV ECMO, ARDS, hypoxemic respiratory failure, bridge to recovery or decision. Relative contraindication would be age above 70. And if the patient has been intubated for more than seven days, these patients generally should be referred for ECMO within the first 72 hours. Contraindications would be BMI greater than 40 or 45, active cancer, incurable cancer, chronic organ failure, such as mentioned in this slide. The patient is considered a candidate for ECMO. Please consult and refer based on these criteria. So as a quick summary, we are recommending that patients who develop ARDS from COVID, that we monitor the tidal volume and blood gases very carefully and always start by checking their ideal body weight. Patients should have the ROX index measured immediately as the patient is started on oxygen supplementation and track the ROX index as a very significant parameter for deterioration. If the patient's ROX index is over five, their mortality is very low, less than 10%. However, if the ROX index drops below five, one should monitor these patients much more closely on high flow nasal cannula. If the ROX index drops below four and you are increasing the FiO2 above 80%, the patient should be transferred to intensive care unit for higher monitoring and potentially intubation. Generally, BiPAP should be avoided unless the patient has COPD or hypercapnic respiratory failure and does not have ARDS. The alarms on the BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation Maximum should be kept at 10 mils per kilogram, ideal body weight. Consider early intubation and code status discussion. Follow the PF ratio and other cytokine parameters. A ROX index of two hours, six hours, and 12 hours in a deteriorating patient may indicate to you clinical decision to intubate. And this may be very useful. Again, there are no absolutes in trying to decide when the optimum time for mechanical ventilation is. However, delays may cause the patient to have further lung injury and increase the mortality, as well as miss the window of opportunity to refer the patient for ECMO. So at this point, I will uh, end this presentation and hopefully this was useful for your facility to at least consider some of these recommendations based on the national and international guidelines. Thank you for your attention.